Martin Hedesh, misspelled here. How many times does your name get misspelled? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, whole, it's a whole lecture. That's a whole lecture. That's a whole lecture in its own right, like about German umlauts and how. Yeah. Uh, is an architect whose design research focuses on the intersection of architecture and urbanism. He holds a diploma of engineering and architecture from the Technische Universität Braunschweig and an MRC from Princeton where he studied as a German Academic Exchange Service Fellow. He's a registered architect in the Netherlands, which I think is another whole story. He has worked <laughs> with firms in Europe and the United States, including Lisa Architects, Atelier Lyon, and OMA. He's been a project leader with WW in Princeton and Atelier Kemp Hill in Rotterdam. His own work includes the curation design of several exhibitions, a winning proposal for the revitalization of an urban block in Syracuse, an experimental film space in San Marcos, Texas, and a master plan for the former airport Berlin Temple Park. His research has been published in numerous venues, including the Plan Journal, Architect Magazine, and he has a forthcoming article on the airport in Germany in the next issue of MIT Thresholds. Martin has held academic positions as the 2010-11 Wortham Fellow at Rice at the Syracuse School of Architecture at the University of Texas at Austin, where he right now <laughs> teaches design studio and graduate theory seminar. His UTSOA graduate studio, A Home is Not a House, recently been awarded the 2018 Architect Magazine Studio Prize. And that's what we're going to hear about today. That's what I'm going to talk right. about. So, um, Martin, will you leave some time for discussion? I hope I will. Yes, it's okay. it's in it's that we'll was the like plan. 45 minutes. Okay. 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 That Thank sounds you. Good. Welcome, Martin Hedish. Okay. So thank you, Michael, for your um, introduction, and um, thanks to Leora and everybody. At, where's Leora? Everybody else. Um, who was involved in, in the organization of um, the talk, but also everybody who came, certainly. I always find it a little intimidating. I come here and like, I have these like, visions of like, just relaxed, sort of sitting here and talking, showing a couple of slides, and then there's like this tremendous audience, um, which then becomes quite intimidating. So I'll, I'll do my best. Um, my presentation, as Michael said, will be um, centered around a studio that I taught a year ago in the spring of 2018 um, that was tied, that had the same title, A Home Is Not A House. Um, and as Michael also mentioned, that studio was awarded the 2018 Studio Prize by Architect Magazine, um, it was, which is a juried, um, very competitive award, which obviously made me and the students very, very proud um, in that context of the studio, because who would not like to be hailed as sort of like celebrating the most innovative academic studios in North America, is what they say. Um, so, I, and I think, I think the, the students um, deserve a lot of credit for that, um, because it was really a fantastic um, studio with fantastic projects. Um, the result was, was sort of like a couple of spreads in Architect Magazine, where um, a total of three projects, or images from three projects, were published. I'm just showing a couple of these images. Um, and so I think one of the reasons why I'm doing this, and why I want to sort of talk about this, is to at least sort of give some of the other projects, because there were 11 really, really good projects in that studio, and I had to sort of make a choice of, of three that I submitted. And I do think there is, there is some, some injustice done to some projects that were equally good. Um, so if anybody is present, um, that's sort of my first apology. Um, and the second, the second apology follows right away, because like now I'm showing six projects from the studio, which still leaves five out there. But I think it was an incredible studio, and, and I think um, like all the projects sort of like are deserving in kind of getting some airtime. The second reason is, is sort of like a little bit more complicated. Um, and there's sort of like a little anecdote, like part of this um, little piece was based on an interview that they did with me. Um, for this kind of little spread. And part of the, the question, so, so the interview at some stage sort of <laughs> talked a little bit about this jury selection process and like the other projects. And one of the things that, that he said, like 
roughly, and I'm paraphrasing, it's just like, oh, there were like a couple of studio projects that were very experimental in nature, and yours was particularly lauded for the sense of kind of realism and sort of constructability. And it, it sort of registered, like it took a while, I don't think I responded to it during the interview, but it took a while to, to register with me to sort of think about like, hey, hang on, what's, what is that? And I know, I know the interviewer didn't mean it as mutually exclusive, um, but just sort of like casually a sentence like that, and it's almost like why why can't something be both at the same time? Like why why can't be why can't we have architecture that's on the one hand very sort of like specific in its kind of outcome and how you draw it, but at the same time make pretty radical assumptions of what it actually is. So I still sort of see and, and, and always saw this studio project and this studio as a kind of piece of design research really in its own right. Um, and so in many ways this presentation is also an attempt from me to kind of retroactively maybe categorize some of the outcomes and kind of think about them as a piece of disciplinary research with regards to, um, and that, that goes back to the subtitle, the medium density housing um, typologies. Um, the title, as many of you may have noticed, is of course not my own invention. Um, it is a reference, a direct reference to um, an article that Rainer Bannum, a rather famous article that Rainer Bannum wrote and that appeared in 1965 in Art in America. Um, in this article, Bannum sets out to um, kind of very vigorously attack the kind of like insistence on the formal idea of the house as a legible, permanent, and formal signifier for the idea of home in a contemporary environment that he says is very much determined by modern technologies that have long surpassed any sort of antiquated idea of what a house should be formally. Bannum's argument in a nutshell is really that what really constitutes the idea of home today in his time, 1965, um, are mostly the sort of invisible and often undesigned systems from air conditioning to television um, that have started to invade that empty shell of the house um, with its pitched roofs and so on. And so his, for him, the logical consequence is like, we don't need that shell. Let's, let's do away with that shell of the house and focus on what really constitutes home. Um, so in that way, I think Benham and I kind of share a, a sort of mission that is um, that is the, the challenge of the idea of, of houseness, the, the idea of this sort of like little kind of single family freestanding house that has proven sort of surprisingly pervasive. Like I think, I think there's still a point to what Benham said, definitely. Although I think we come at it from slightly different angles. I would say that my approach really um, connects, where, where Benham connected the idea of sort of house to an emergent technology, um, and uh, technologies um, of sort of forming a living environment, I'm very much focused on that intersection of sort of what it means to have a home in a city. So the idea of um, architecture and urbanism, how do we choose to live? How do we negotiate our space with others? Um, and how do our dwellings form clusters, districts, villages, cities? Um, I started from a kind of like contemporary challenge. So the, the, the inherent question here was really the challenge or, or the observation that housing as a category in American centers and in big urban centers has gravitated towards really sort of two extremes in recent years. And Austin, I think, is no exception. Um, on the one hand, we kind of see um, a development of kind of like rather intense densification um, that often results in kind of like multi-story mixed-use um, apartment blocks such as this unnamed one, I, I could have shown any number, um, that really kind of start to think about the city as something that is kind of like vertical, that's very dense. And then on the other hand, um, on the ground, so to speak, the freestanding single family house remains to this day the kind of mostly unchallenged ideal of a lot of American families. Now, the problem of the kind of like this dichotomy is really that the former, i.e. this one, um, tends to cater to a more transient population of, of young professionals, um, um, whereas rising property values as a result of the former and kind of like growing cities have made the latter um, an unattainable ideal for many families as well as sort of create some really kind of strange 
outcomes um, in relation to kind of density and spaces between those freestanding houses. Um, and so, so that, that was really kind of one of the challenges that we wanted to address with the studio. Um, the, the lack, I mean, uh, the lack of middle ground has been addressed in discourse in, in new urbanism as the question of the sort of missing middle. Um, I, I do think that that's a very appropriate analysis. I also strongly disagree with some of the solutions that the new urbanism proposes, which are often really kind of centered around some of the more historic um, types of dwelling and, and so really that was something we were less interested in but we were interested in really kind of taking the challenge of medium density housing um, and try to sort of like through architectural rigorous architectural typological <coughs> experimentation spatial innovation um, reconsider what this kind of medium density house housing in the city could be um, this is just an, an example of, of a project that was built elsewhere that, that does not adhere to some of these um, historic typologies. Uh, it's, it's in London. Um, three parameters were really sort of like the drivers that, that I sort of put on the table as, as kind of parameters. One was the, the idea of the private entrance. So, so the idea of ownership that's conveyed through having your own front door that does not lead to a corridor, but that leads somewhere to a street and kind of like is on the, on the ground. The second parameter was the idea of the private patio or outdoor space um, that is not a balcony, but that is kind of like a space that can be used um, for plants and, and has a little bit more of that quality that typically single family houses um, give you. And the third one was the idea of the car as being something that's not negated, but is actually sort of like um, part of that. So, so like a little bit the reference to the sort of like double garage uh, driveway that like a lot of for a lot of people is actually a factor in considering what house um, to buy the site in our case um, I'm just going to show it really briefly was both seen as prototypical as much as specific so um, it's it's prototypical in a sense that it, it, it's kind of what I call a sort of second row site so you have Cesar Chavez um, and on the east side and then Chalmers Avenue um, a block that's sort of bisected by a little um, alley and, and so it is to be expected that along these kind of big corridors, these density corridors, with or without code next, like um, apartment blocks are going to go up, mixed use blocks are going to go up. And behind it, the second row is still kind of the old low rise fabric. So in that way, um, that it's a real sort of like systemic problem that we're dealing with as a city that that cities, probably not just Austin, are dealing with. And so I think I think it's a it's a sort of like prototypical site. Um, with sort of very specific conditions that that I think um, kind of were, were sort of put in front of the students, but could also be thought of as as prototypical in different contexts in Austin or beyond. Um, really, the program was for um, twenty to twenty four residential units and nothing else. Different sizes, no mixed use program, which I think is often used as an excuse for publicness, but instead it was really sort of the question that, that, that we wanted to foreground um, about a calibration of spatial gradients from public to private, the formal nature um, between agglomeration, part, and whole, um, and some of the testing of kind of new or, or new or, or old for that matter materials and construction techniques um, in housing. Um, I, I want to try to sort of talk about some of the projects. Um, in categories that I think are useful to sort of like assess some of the typological, specific typological innovations for each project. Um, the first category, so, so these three categories are mats, rows, and fields. They're sort of tentative. I don't know if you have any suggestions like how they may change. I'm, I'm open to that. Um, mat is the first category that I define it. It probably has been defined differently, but for my purpose here, I want to define it as a predominantly horizontally oriented um, structure of urban fabric um, in which the logics of circulation, structure, space, and systems are integrated. Um, usually flexibility in the mat is comes from a coherent system um, out of the, the sort of like repetition and variation. Um, it's often modular. It um, has a preference for structure over space for aggregation over composition. 
um, and constitutes a matrix rather than a spatial type. Um, of course, it goes back, and just really quickly for some background, um, this type of ground scraper rose to prominence in the 60s and 70s, is associated with the architecture of Team 10, specifically Kandilis Josic Woods, whose Berlin Free University competition model that my professor Manfred Schiethelm actually um, was the project architect for. Um, and or Aldo van Eyck, um, Allison and Peter Smithson, um, and although this is an institutional building, and it sort of like in a, some ways kind of tries to apply this idea of fabric to the institution of the university, a lot of it um, is actually rooted in the inspiration that like these architects took from um, the vernacular housing projects that they found often in northern Africa, Morocco. Um, so, so in that way, it's, it's very much rooted to a very old idea of how cities have been constructed. Um, and the organic growth, specifically, of kind of these structures, and this is actually a new project, Kandilis Josic Woods, um, from the, I think, early 60s in Morocco. Um, but that, that the true needs of the inhabitants were actually reflected much better in this kind of like repetitive fabric than in what at the time in the 60s was the kind of like rigorous formal abstraction of, of orthodox modernism. Um, in the studio, we looked at a couple of precedents um, of a map building that, that had kind of like this inherent flatness to this. This is uh, MVRDV, um, Patio Islands, a sort of project. Um, but specifically, I think this project, like the Nexus Housing by OMA, stood out um, in that it does something that, that I actually not only noticed like when we looked at it, like it's, it's quite remarkable in that it kind of um, introduces a kind of sectional development um, into the idea of the mat. So it, it's still a mat, it's still sort of like, it is a matrix for spaces, but it is, it combines kind of the, the densities of uh, Japan's residential fabric um, with this idea of the mat, and I think creates something which is quite important. Um, and students focused on kind of like both scales, on the one hand, the scale of the overall, so how does this project or other precedents for that matter, this is just an, a, a sort of an example, um, set up general rules, and then on the other hand, how does the individual unit kind of find its space um, inside that overall fabric? These are two examples of the kind of models that I had students um, produce. Um, note the total absence of materiality, which, which was actually on purpose, because I wanted the focus to be on space and not on material during this exercise. Um, so the first project that I'm going to show, hi Paul, hi Becca, um, is, is a project that, that really sort of like um, starts to kind of take on this lineage of the mat typology. And, and like it, it's, it's actually kind of very simple in terms of massing in that like within a gridded superstructure, um, it sets up alternating spaces um, for exterior patios um, and interior living spaces. When you look at the plan, though, that, that relationship actually becomes um, much more complex in that the, the grid, the simple grid, sort of starts to be offset to create a number of intermediate spaces that in some cases are used as transitional spaces, porches um, that could be a closed or open. In other cases, they become solid strips of poche that contain services um, and sometimes um, circulation. Um, the other thing that, that was very interesting to me about this project was that it sets up a kind of layering in the mat and introduces a kind of sectional quality um, between a sort of ground level that's very, very um, stark um, in its materiality, like they, they used brick for this, and then the kind of like softness um, of the vegetation in the patio in between, kind of these pockets of green, but also the lightness of the kind of hats that are sort of perched on top of that. Um, so really students, in, in some ways, I think, were taking inspiration from, from the, the Kohlhaas housing and sort of like introducing at least some kind of sectional narrative to the mat <coughs> in which um, really there are two very distinct worlds that get set up um, as layers that are kind of connected by these, um, I would call them like vertical pins, but they were intended to be light shafts. Um, they bring, bring light in from above, but also circulation is often tied to them, and that they're sort of actually quite dramatic spaces in a way that the um, Paul and Becker envisioned these. Um, this is another 
rendering that I think kind of shows the both both the sort of like dichotomy between the kind of like um, solidness of the kind of base, the kind of plinth, and the kind of vegetation in between, and then also kind of the lightness of the hats. Um, I think that that difference in construction kind of also comes across very nicely in this large final model. Um, and to me, actually, like what was very, very interesting about this project is that it, through this kind of like two layeredness, um, sets up something that, that actually kind of also um, seems to sort of speak to a certain idea of navigating this fine line between collectivity of the mat, so those are the mat as a whole, it's the plinth, it's the big base, um, on which then kind of these individual units that are all sort of slightly different from each other are sort of like perched. And, and so you have kind of these two worlds. You have the sort of very much the collective base that, that's a sort of like whole, but then there is some space for kind of individual difference, individual kind of plan layouts um, in those kind of lighter pieces um, on top of that. Um, the second project I'm gonna show, so, so while, while the previous project, um, really sort of like tries to navigate that fine line between individuality um, and collectivity of sort of dwelling and fabric. The next project really sort of takes no prisoners in that regard and um, is a project that really, really talks exclusively about um, fabric as a sort of collective, almost sort of urban, um, urban device. Um, the author of this project, um, takes the kind of like agglomeration of the mat, of the sort of unit, the, the expansive unit, um, to its, well, I don't know, the most radical, but to a very radical conclusion um, at the scale of urbanism. And it really sort of asks the question, well, what if the city really became a series of rooms? What if we reduced the city to kind of a series of individual cells and th the potential of the mat to sort of like in, in some ways become a city as it was originally intended, um, is I think sort of played out here to a sort of pretty high um, degree. Um, so it's not a building, or, or, or the city does not become a city of buildings, but a city of rooms exclusively. Um, individually, or it, the, the individuality of the inhabitant in this vision really only exists in the relative privacy of the single basic module. Each unit is sort of equipped um, with basic systemic uh, plug and play components for electricity, sometimes water, um, etc. cetera, um, as the inhabitants rent out or buy any sort of combination of one room or several rooms um, to kind of form their own kind of little mini compound inside this um, mega structure. Um, so flatness, actually, the flatness of the surface here is an asset, as a sort of playing field upon which kind of these individual narratives can play out. Um, hallways are exclusively seen as uh, collective spaces that are negotiated every time over and over again, just like often the street in a city would be negotiated. I'm playing soccer, somebody else wants to drive by. Right, so, so I think that negotiation of the sort of public space inside the building is, is something that was very important um, in this project. Um, the next type that I want to talk about is the row um, as kind of like another housing um, typology. Row houses, terraced houses. Um, Unlike the mat, which in many ways goes back to some antique iterations of um, mm -hmm. vernacular, um, row houses really rise to prominence and are associated with an ambition of efficiency and rationalization um, that emerge with sort of like a, a sort of the first um, emergence of capitalism in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. Um, so typically rows um, are defined by a superstructure of load bearing, mostly shear walls, um, often arranged at an equidistant, uh, at that same distance from each other, and then the compartments that are seen as infill in some ways. The structural principle in the row is usually the same or the same as the spatial principle um, in that it's fixed in one direction for load-bearing um, purposes, and somewhat flexible in 
the other direction. Um, so there's a push and pull that can happen within each compartment. Um, the shared walls and the kind of like re simple and repetitive nature makes the row on the one hand very effective and efficient to construct. Um, to how units always share a full wall. Um, it's a relatively ecologically sustainable way. Um, think of heat gain, heat loss, the kind of like front, the, the front of the building where most of the kind of like heat loss or heat gain, depending on where you are, um, happens um, is, is kind of limited in its width, which I think on the other hand um, already kind of hints at one of the potential weaknesses of this type of house. If you imagine <laughs> that, that there is kind of there are certain limits that you have in order to get light into that and that you really only have these two directions to work with. This is a diagram that I made years ago for when I worked for Atelier Campetil. Um, and, and the Dutch really have sort of perfected the, the art of the contemporary row house. And I, I think these four diagrams really sort of explain everything that you need to know about the row house and the kind of like formula. Um, there is kind of like a fixed dimension for 80, which does not actually change very much. Um, there is the, the sort of plan has a kind of certain length. So everything that is arranged in the plan um, has to work lengthwise. That, that usually goes for circulation, that goes for double height spaces, um, and so on. This is actually the, the finished project um, that this diagram talked about. And again, I think you can see in this project like both some of the um, potentials of the row as a sort of like aesthetic component, as a sort of design component. Um, I think it's a beautiful project. Um, but you can also see some of the problematic sides, which, which have to do with sort of like the share, the, the individual kind of like pieces of land in front and in the back that are actually sort of like very exposed um, against the entire project. So while this was one of the precedents that, that we kind of studied that I gave to kind of like understand some of the um, limitations and potentials, the next project um, starts to add several components um, to this system, which I think make it fairly interesting. One is the question of what happens when rows are actually combined. So when you're not talking about one row, but several rows that set up a relationship to each other. This is a Siedlung Hallen in Bern in Switzerland. Um, what if you introduce a kind of sectional quality? You can see that little section on the top. Um, and then most importantly, I think what happens if you integrate exterior spaces into kind of the larger structural whole. And I think that can be shown in these two photographs where um, it's actually very nice to kind of see how this push and pull is being played out within the structure. This is um, sort of like an analytical drawing that also came out from a group of students um, in this studio. Um, and these are two of the kind of models, like this is the beautiful model of the Siedlung Halen. Um, and the next project um, really is a project that um, creates a kind of like solid urban block, but is, I would say, genetically very much tied um, to this idea of the row as the kind of basic organizing principle. Um, so, so the block is, is sort of like a block that they, they actually, the, the group here titled this, this uh, project, like the, the French term massif, as sort of like a sort of like um, a rock formation that is carved or demarcated by faults and flexures, which I thought was, was interesting. Um, but really when you sort of like look at the kind of systemic nature of how this block is set up, um, it's very much um, an experimental tile take on the idea of the row in housing. Um, and I think the, the sort of significant part here is that the depth of the site is kind of utilized to its full extent. So um, the, the kind of diagram, as you can see in this sort of very nice kind of explanatory diagrams, um, kind of pushes that um, unit between two shear walls all the way to the back of the given site. And then instead of having one unit inside those two or between those two walls, um, the students now have the ambition to insert three full units, which then of course causes um, that infill piece to undergo significant transformations um, formally, spatially, um, and so on. So these are, these are just sort of like diagrams of those three kind of stacked units. Um, each of them has direct access um, 
to the ground and on, on both on, on both sides, actually one to the street in the front and one in the back um, to the parking. And the result is like, I always like this diagram because I, I sort of would, would call it sort of the row house on steroids. I just think it's, it's such a crazy thing, but it, it really sort of speaks very well to, I think, the idea of that a lot more can go on between two walls than um, just one unit. Um, are they 4.8 meters? No, they're not 4.8 meters. I actually don't know how much they are, but they are slightly more, um, which you could sort of talk about structurally and that, that of, of course has implications for um, if you wanted to construct it in a cheap way. So, um, and, but I think, I think that the, so, so the process of kind of pulling people in to kind of the depth of this block is really sort of being celebrated in a way that sort of like people kind of in parts sort of ascend to through a kind of series of um, individual and often private courtyard spaces um, towards their unit. Um, you can see in the section um, that kind of the, the actual living spaces kind of change their allegiance and they sort of like flip from one wall to the other, which is kind of like one of the main um, operational strategies that this group used in order to organize kind of the spaces and get light into the individual um, units. Um, parking, as I mentioned, is kind of like tucked underneath. So, so they're taking um, advantage of this kind of slightly strange profile in section, um, which was a direct response to the site and the idea that they had to somehow negotiate between the kind of very residential low um, front of the street south of Cesar Chavez and then the kind of potentially higher blocks directly adjacent to Cesar Chavez and I think they actually found a, a quite an interesting diagram and in sort of like tucking kind of parking under it um, but then actually if you see the stairs in the back um, each of these courtyards has direct access and sort of like drop down to that parking space which I thought was was actually a very smart way of kind of solving that problem um, and this is kind of like a, a sort of image that shows kind of the front where it kind of really kind of drops down to that point where the individual door um, gives access to each unit or to the outside space of each unit. The next project um, is um, a very different take on the idea of the row. Um, and it, it sort of takes the row as a kind of like baseline, the kind of like organization of the shear walls as a baseline of unit organization, but then really had the desire to kind of like build up from it and really sort of like take that structural wall and, and really sort of like pull it up and, and in some ways like add a different kind of type of vertical um, housing on top of this. And that, that sort of like site plan actually shows again a very similar basic idea of sort of like subdividing the kind of site into kind of like these very long and narrow rows with parking on the back um, and the kind of front entrance um, in the front towards the um, um, street, Willow Street. Um, and so the unit that, that they, this group ended up with is sort of like extremely long and narrow and, and of course like to sort of take some of that away there was already kind of like one idea that little kind of courtyards and patios are inserted into that unit um, both to organize the space and to get light in. Um, and at the same time then this unit kind of starts to develop in a vertical way. So we really sort of like have the ground floor layer in which kind of the unit is a, is a very standard, slightly strange looking elongated unit. Um, and then on top of each unit this group envisioned a roof terrace and you can also see that like there's exactly one spot always where a sort of like stair pierces through that roof um, in order to kind of then develop into kind of like a fully blown sort of what I call sort of the, the mini tower um, that kind of starts to emerge from that row. I think you can see it in this, this section actually kind of shows um, kind of how this is seen to operate as a whole. Um, and I think you can see here that like the structural lines are actually kind of lines that are meant to go through. So, so it's really kind of the shear wall that is sort of extended as a wall or as a kind of like frame um, above in taking advantage of the kind of like structural capacity that this shear wall has to begin with. Um, the third category, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, 
is um, what I call tentatively called a field. And, and there's, of, of course, there's some overlap between field um, and mat, um, but I still think I would see them as, as distinct categories because where the field, uh, where the mat is a systemic matrix, um, the field is more of an agglomeration of discrete, possibly independent objects. Um, so these objects can be spatially distinct. They can, but need not necessarily be tied to a coherent system. Um, and while a mat is usually homogeneous in density due to its kind of systemic nature, a field can have um, concentrations of greater density or lesser density. There are very different types of fields. Like one of the precedent, here, precedent that I gave was the Seijiu townhouses by Sejima and Associates, um, where a sort of like a, the field is formed by a kind of like self-similar family of objects um, that are kind of understood as kind of part of the same construct. Um, they're very loosely agglomerated in plan, um, giving a lot of importance to the spaces in between, actually, rather than the actual um, manifestation of the object. What was very interesting in this precedent was actually that like, the, the apparent equation between one volume, one unit was broken, and, and you can sort of see in, in plan, you can see that a little bit how um, a unit starts to span several of those boxes. And this is sort of like a, an analysis diagram that this student group um, did that, that kind of started to um, kind of really map out the different kind of unit um, units in the, inside this field, which would sort of like gives you a very different kind of oscillating picture that is not so much tied to kind of each individual object anymore. Second type of field is a kind of um, very different one. Um, this is Olam Angers' proposal for a series of what he calls urban villas in Marburg, 1976. Um, and here the agglomeration itself and the spaces in between are actually almost entirely unimportant. Um, it's sort of arranged on a grid system. Um, Coincidentally, actually, this is a little bit like the Manhattan Grid, so this is just a little side note. 1976, um, O.M. Ongers was working very closely with Rem Kohlhaas, who wrote an interesting little book at the time, which was titled Delirious New York. So there you go. Um, there, there, there's there's this, this, this idea that each field in this kind of grid um, has kind of the um, potential to house slightly different variations, slightly different visions of how to live and what that would look like. Um, so really kind of Ungers, for Ungers, this sort of playing out these possibilities within the field, the possibilities of the individual object being different, organized differently and sort of catered to individual needs and experiences is something that he plays out in these like endless scenarios of, of possibilities. So this is the same project, just sort of like over and over again in different variations, and kind of different variations of what this kind of vertical um, mini tower would look like. Um, again, students, I think, did a very nice job here of kind of um, building this um, unit. Um, so there's two field projects that I want to kind of show. Um, and the first one is actually in a, in a fairly straightforward way, takes up this idea of the kind of like urban villa um, in a sort of fairly consistently um, sp um, spread field of um, repetition. Um, each unit in this, in this kind of project is assigned a base, sort of like a plot on which it resides, um, on which they kind of can shift and wiggle just a little bit in order to sort of take into account lighting, exposure, um, and kind of fenestration. Um, but what's interesting here is actually that the, the unit for starters doesn't actually only develop vertically, but it's dug in to begin with. So, so by sort of digging in, digging each unit into their respective plot, what, what is created is actually kind of like a, um, well, not really a ground, but a minus one space that becomes kind of a um, space that's actually kind of can be fairly open and has its own kind of little sunken garden as a way to achieve a sense of kind of individuality and privacy within that fairly dense field, which I think was, was a kind of an, another smart kind of way of um, 
dealing with this. And then above that, it's really sort of above that, like one open space. It's kind of the regular, more regularized kind of living spaces that um, start to kind of like develop upwards. I think I want to point out particularly that this group took a really, really um, good care of trying to um, arrange windows in, in such a way that kind of privacy for the most part was um, an issue that was actually um, that that kind of worked, which, which is which was not an easy thing in an arrangement like that. Um, and this is kind of like one of those projects um, in its kind of agglomeration part of the agglomeration. You can do, see, sort of see the kind of like sunken um, patios. Um, and this is kind of like a view which I think sort of talks actually very nicely also kind of about the kind of like scale, sort of like a project that really hovers somewhere between, is it one, is it several, where you can sort of like read the unit, the individuality, but at the same time it sort of like creates a scale that is probably more likely to be the scale that the city will have eventually. Um, and then the next and last project um, that I want to show um, creates a very, very different kind of field condition um, in a, what I would say, it was a very critical dialogue with the um, studio brief. Um, a home is not a house. Well, that's what you think. That's what this group said. Like a home is indeed a house, and and that that was I think one of the one of the, the, the sort of biggest strengths that they they really said like no houseness is important. That sort of legibility, the symbolism that comes with it is really really important. So let's take it to an extreme. Let's let's just see what we get. Um, and so there's kind of like a dense agglomeration of self similar houses. Um, really sort of endorses this kind of desire for the legibility of the dwelling. Um, it sort of creates a clusters and pockets of shared collective spaces, sometimes individual space at, at very different scales um, that kind of make it work almost like, like a sort of like new iteration of a kind of medieval village space. Um, sometimes there's sort of like a lot of attention is paid to kind of like slight height differences um, to kind of like offset these spaces and demarcate um, different spaces um, from each other. Um, and at the same time, when you look closely, um, again, sort of like this idea of the house, the house versus one unit versus one pitch roof is kind of undermined, not unsimilar to the first precedent um, project here in the field condition that I showed, where really now there, there are several options that like either a unit is different houses, different volumes, or at times there's actually a volume that may be occupied by two units. So, so really it's sort of that, that simple equation of one house, one unit um, is again um, kind of like undermined um, in, a, in a sort of like somewhat tongue in cheek, um, but, but I think actually very effective um, way. Um, this is just like a beautiful little diagram that, that like I think this group put a lot of effort in. This is actually kind of a 10 foot offset um, in order to kind of deal with fire um, restrictions and like this, this was sort of like along the progress. But I, I think this, this group worked very, very hard on sort of making this um, work and sort of like to see what really the implications of this kind of density um, is. Um, and I just thought this, this was a nice diagram. Um, on the other hand, I think the, so section plays a role, as I said, and so, so some units, um, as you can see here, actually kind of like um, bridge over from kind of one object, one house in that field to another house um, in that field. Um, and therefore, you, you, you could go in somewhere, but, but you never really know where you're gonna resurface and, and where you're gonna come out, and like if that's your neighbor or you. Um, so the result um, is, as I said, like something that, that I would call an urban village. Um, and very interestingly, kind of the legibility now that sort of like starts with this pitch roof house um, starts to kind of oscillate between part and whole. So really there's on the one hand the kind of promise of a living model that affirms both the value of kind of individual expression um, in each kind of individual piece. But on the other hand, taken together, um, there is a very clear presence of a potential collective in the city that is, that is sort of like distinct from whatever is around it in the city. Um, this was the last project that I showed. This is the last slide. It's just like um, a sort of nice kind of in um, that sort of process um, slide um, 
that kind of chose as kind of my last image. Um, and so, so I think in, in some ways, like just to sort of like um, close this, I hope I, I sort of was able to do two things. I think on the one hand, I was able to sort of like bring in kind of like, um, try, like an emergent, and this is something that's possibly in, in progress for me, sort of an emergent narrative about kind of like um, some of these projects as um, kind of responses and, and expansions of kind of housing types and kind of some innovations that are like potentials for innovations within these types um, that address what I think is a, is a very, very pressing um, question. Um, and I think the second thing is, is probably something that that's maybe between the lines a little bit more in that I think it, it's sort of like I'm, I'm sort of exposing a lot of my personal sort of philosophy of, of kind of how I teach studio, what I see studio as doing and, and like again sort of going back to that little anecdote of, of where I see sort of like well um, I think you can do very wild things um, but I, I tried and I think I hope in this studio I, I also try to sort of like um, to an extent like hold students responsible for doing that sort of on the basis of some, some sort of very very dry disciplinary tools and means like drawing plans and sort of like really trying to figure out what something that's really wild would look like in plans so that we can actually sort of assess it um, to figure out whether it is actually really wild or maybe not. And, and so I think that's that's something like I'm open to questions. If, if anybody has questions about either of these two sides, I'm, I'm happy to um, answer those hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we could all more or less stay in place till one, that would be great. Except for you. <laughs> Questions? I'll start with just a very simple yeah. question. It seems that one of the kinds of space that gets sacrificed at these densities is out outdoor covered space. Mm -hmm. The idea of the porch, the pavilion. Yeah. Because um, like in this, as beautiful as these are, mm -hmm. uh, there's a kind of a, a compactness of territory mm -hmm. as to what's owned mm -hmm. and what's not, so, so to speak. And the outside is left. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that true? Or what? Oh, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I think, I think it's a good observation. It's, it's, mm -hmm. um, I think in some ways, I... I I would agree that that's probably the most difficult space that, that I, I think in, in some ways like when you come up against certain densities that is the first one the first thing, the first thing that, that, that gets kind of thrown under the bus I think there are some projects like I think especially sort of like I think Paul and Becker's uh, project for example kind of like um, introduced kind of like these mm -hmm. these kind of intermediate spaces of um, kind of patios mm -hmm. um, and I think so that's, I think that's also something that space, I, th I feel like it's, it's sort of like a very um, specific space that may be, um, there's a specific in Austin. And so there, there's some urban environments in which that, that space could be really useful and there are other urban environments in, in which it's completely unusable possibly. Um, so I think that's where I, in some ways, left it up to kind of the students like to how specifically they want to kind of make their spatial arrangement a kind of like um, innovation of, of typology or something that responds to kind of certain climatic conditions in in Austin but I, I do agree I think I think it's it's true that that space is, is the hardest space to bring in there and that probably some of the projects in, in that it's, it's it's the first one to go Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you have speculated with students about who potential dwellers would be. Like, it, it's almost implicit in the typology who might be attracted to one project as mm -hmm. opposed to the other. So I'm curious about that. And the other thing, very briefly, whether you have tried to compare the density of this in each of these projects mm -hmm. to some kind of a benchmark. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the, the, the first question is, the, the answer to the first question is no. We have like I, I think I think that and, and that's a very sort of decisive no because I'm not interested in transient dwellers. I'm also not interested in 
people who want kind of big suburban mansions and make like, so so I, I think there, there was a sort of specific reduction of that which that's why I brought in sort of like the discourse on the missing middle because that, that sort of targets a very specific idea of dweller like middle class I don't want to say families because that, that there are so many connotations that I don't want to necessarily sort of subscribe <laughs> to um, but but a certain kind of dweller that that could or could not have kids that that is looking for something that is not explicitly low cost or low income housing so like that that's clearly not the goal um, but also somebody who is willing to sacrifice um, kind of that privacy of the mansion and the big garden for centrality. Um, so so it's a, um, I think that there is sort of like inherent in the kind of program description and kind of like unit sizes that kind of start somewhere around I think 1300 to kind of like 2022 I think. Um, so so I, th I think there is sort of like prescriptiveness in that program that, that I was interested in exploring rather than sort of array of, of very different dwellers. The second question, um, I think is, I, I'll sort of take that as a suggestion because I think it's a really good suggestion to do that. I, I, yeah, I, I would be, I mean, I, th I think that that's actually, that would have been fantastic and would probably still be fantastic to kind of like compare them even to things like the Venix um, density atlas or, or something. So, so I think that there's definitely some work that, that could be done on that just to sort of like, um, yeah. Do you see these as um, uh, discrete interventions or more prototypical for something that could be more like the Malaguerra Quarter? Um, I see them as both. I mean, I think they're both. They're sort of like rooted in a, in a site, but I think possibly the way I talked about them, I see them a little bit more as prototypical and typological um, ideas that are sort of like based on kind of types of architecture and how those could be developed um, and what some of the parameters could be. So that's why in, in some ways I think I chose a site that was a site that was a specific site, but it was also as generic as I could get with so a site. Like small. Like it, yes. It seems like, because you talked about mm -hmm. it like they were prototypical for mm -hmm. the kind of thing, like this is amazing stuff in Ivra. Mm -hmm. But then it seems like many, like they were developed in a sense as the exception, mm -hmm. rather than as a map that yeah. in a much larger district. You know, I mean, I think that's, I think that's, that's another good question. Like, how do they, do they proliferate as mats, or um, do they actually remain? Because I, I think typically, you know, that, 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 so the mat, and in some ways, to take that example, was was sort of like an outcome of the kind of '60s idea, like let's rebuild the whole city. Right. I think today we're, we're probably at a point where, where it is, well, you, you can accept the fact, and like realistically it's, it's going to happen, that, that these things get developed in small chunks. So, so utopia is nothing that sort of like covers the whole city anymore, but, but utopia may actually just be a little chunk of an urban village that sits on that kind of part of the block, and the next utopia is, is down the road and looks like something completely different. So I, I, think, I think there is, I think that the idea that these are prototypical sort of little chunks of, I don't want to say utopia, but, but little chunks of visions of how, how you could live um, that don't necessarily have the ambition to say we know it all. Um, I, I would say that's probably... The marketplace will be replicated that, I think that, that could be. That, that could be one of the parameters by which that gets determined. Um, but I'm, 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 sort of, I'm just wary of this sort of like ambition of sort of like, I know how to build this, like, we know how to build a city, like, I think, like, we know how to build this piece, and then somebody else may build a completely different piece somewhere else, and that's kind of plur pluralism. Questions from the students? Yeah, I think it's sort of related to what Kevin said. Mm -hmm. I, I may be just aggregating all of these at uh, once because they happened really quickly, but it seemed to me that there's a lot of variety in these projects within, e like, I mean, within each project itself. Mm -hmm. And just some of them even creating like illegible maze-like conditions. And I'm wondering what the value is in that and why we didn't just see some much more straightforward, clearly legible, like uh, diagrammatic expressions. If you're really trying to create a functional typology, mm -hmm. it could be proliferated. Because these seem to be like extremely formally interesting Mm 
and lots of variety and variation within a dense little pool. Did that just happen that way? Um, so, so um, what, what do you mean, like, I guess, I guess, like, sort of simplicity versus complexity, like, because I, I would, in some ways, I would argue that, like, even the ones that were kind of the most complex, well, most of them, um, have, have <laughs> not all of them, but most, most of them sort of start with a kind of, like, an, a sort of, like, organizing idea that then sort of allows for all of these kind of differences to come in. So that there's, like, I would argue that there's, in most cases, there is there's sort of like a um, kind of mechanism, a control mechanism that kind of determines what can and what cannot happen. Um, so which, which I think, I think was actually kind of something that, that I, I mostly sort of like tried to, tried to sort of like hold students <laughs> responsible for, like what, what's the control mechanism here and what does that allow you to do and what doesn't it allow it to do. Um, so I think I think within that control mechanism, I, I do think that kind of complexities or generating complexities are a good thing. Like maybe this last project is sort of like a bad example <laughs> for that. Um, but but even even that in some ways has a sort of like potential simplicity in it. If if you think about that, these are not or could not be different from any of the two by four houses that you kind of see with all kind of different forms and shapes that are built like everywhere in suburbia. So so in some ways you could argue that this could actually be the most buildable of them all because it doesn't rely on any kind of like concrete. It's like okay, let let them let them be two by fours. It's good. That's that's how we build houses. So um, in that way, like. And, and that, that was a discussion that actually came up in the in the review of this of this um, project. But and it seems that you know sort of your main critique point is um, about the open space that's created by row houses and by uh, single family houses. You know, so because all your projects um, show you know sort of that this is where you where you change the most, right? And mm -hmm. where sort of this public space um, could that be um, activated for the for the, the context, you know, sort of mm -hmm. in a different way than sort of the row house or the single mm -hmm. family house, and then sort of here, you know, where you, with the one that you call the urban village or so, is that something you know sort of that would be public and sort of do you want to eliminate basically the concept of yeah. the garden and so on? And I think that is that was the the kind of interesting shift. I think that's I think that that that's a question that came up like over and over again during the studio afterwards that I asked myself <laughs> in, in some ways and, and I think there's, it's, there's possibly sort of like different answers. I think some of them do integrate kind of an idea, maybe not of necessarily public, but at least collective space, like the village where you, sort of, you can walk through. And, and so there is something that happens in addition to what we know as public space, because in that, in that area, right, the, the public space really is the street and the sidewalk. And then you have a private lot. The density you gain um, is at the cost of that of mm -hmm. that private open space, right? As well, yeah. the buildings are yeah. not a lot denser than a conventional row house or so. They have two or three stories. But so if it's at the cost of the collective, the, the collective, of the collective space. space. Yeah, and so that's um, as a sort of if I want so to, to mm -hmm. understand your didactic lesson is sort of like don't do that kind of Huge open private spaces that are not. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, 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 I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand correctly, but I, I think I, I sort of there's a, there's a sort of equation right that has three parts. <laughs> there's sort of like public space of the city. There's kind of the, the private patio space, and then there's kind of density, and, and those are sort of like the three things that somehow have to be brought in line. And I, I do think that um, in in the equation. For for me, the idea of the public space within the developments was actually not necessarily at the forefront. And because and the argument there for me is that it's a street <coughs> that traditionally is lined with private lots, right? So, so we don't have necessarily the obligation to introduce more public space than the city has. I think streets are fantastic public spaces, sidewalks are fantastic public spaces. So we have a responsibility to sort of like relate to those. But it would be like but taking this, this development, mm -hmm. looking at all the fronts that do have street frontage, mm -hmm. and possibly doing balconies mm -hmm. or patios, and so that they dialogue into the public yeah. space. 
so the, the perimeter yeah. could be distinctly different from the, the inside. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a really good point. I think that's a, that's a really good point that I would sort of... Um, but that was, that was at the part of the question I was asking, because it seems like when one starts to imagine this at a scale that's larger than a, a plot, mm -hmm. a larger parcel... It's like a four house parcel. Right, that, that, mm -hmm. that um, you start to get into issues of, of like collective space. Mm -hmm. and how this would start to aggregate. And if it, like one version is the, the CISO one, where it's like it is just the streets, and that's, mm -hmm. the, kind of, that's the collective space. And the other is this, this other thing, where there, is, there are different kinds of semi-public spaces. Mm -hmm. And you could even say that you know, the 25-foot setback in a single-family lot is that you don't get literal access into mm -hmm. someone's <coughs> room, but you do get... That the dog can pee. Them. Or you, just get, you get that vista. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, cause, cause it, it, it just to me it's, it's interesting that we talked about it prototypically, but actually mm -hmm. it's really conceived of as something just that. Mm -hmm. and that the, the missing thing, I think, is Barbara's point about the collective space and the, the, a concept for collective space. Maybe one more question from the student. Um, from my understanding of the green air plan, are you finding he finds value in? The great outdoors and sort of how someone can live without walls and let's say any nature but with an element of heating and climatic <coughs> control mm -hmm. in nature. Um, versus here these projects I think place value on sort of the urban village and the quality of living overlapping with other people as well as having that like, individual courtyard. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the values that these projects work to create are the ideal way to live? Or do you think that these are sort of a compromise between what you get from nature and what you get from living in a city? That's a really tough question. <laughs> I, mean, I think uh, so. So, um, is it a compromise, is it, or is it an ideal? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is it a compromise, or is it an ideal? Right. Like, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I mean, so, so, I mean, for Bannum, it was sort of very much an ideal, right? It's sort of like the the kind of noble savage, like the the technology savvy noble savage, kind of that who is sort of like sitting around the TV instead of like the the fireplace, right? Like that. That was sort of like his his take. Um, you know, I think it's, I think I probably started this as, as actually kind of like very low-key problem-solving <laughs> exercise, if you will, right? I mean, it was really sort of like, okay, we have a problem. Where, where are we at? I mean, just without sort of like thinking too much about sort of ideals or the ideal way to live, but really just like there's some parameters. Let's, let's sort of accept them and see what, what comes out of it. I think, I think then to some extent, of course, there are maybe sort of ideals that kind of kept creeping into some of these. Maybe, maybe, the, the, maybe actually they can, this, this is not, not supposed to sound like a cop out, but um, maybe I'm actually the wrong person to ask that question. Because in, in some ways, in some ways, like, I don't know, I can't speak for all of the projects. And I think there may be differences. I think, I think there may be actually differences in, in each project, where, where for some projects, it, it, it's, it really is, it sort of becomes a solution to a problem, um, while for other projects, it becomes a kind of like vision of how to live and, and how to sort of like set up a kind of like little slice of an ideal city. Um, I, I certainly, I don't think I pushed either, like to, to sort of like talk about kind of like the, the sort of like you know, studio pedagogy, like... As, as with tradition, thank you so, so much. We'll, um... <laughs> the, tradition, the tradition I'm referring to is people stick around for another 15 or 20 minutes. So please do. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Yeah.